On this week's how-to project, we're going to set up an SPS propagation system. We'll show you the differences between this system and the softy tank we did a few weeks ago. Discuss some equipment changes, show you how to plumb it, and answer some of the common questions related to these kits. The biggest difference between these two kits is this one has a sump to increase system water volume. The reason we want to increase water volume is because SPS corals consume calcium and alkalinity which will have to be continually replaced. The three main methods of maintaining calcium and alkalinity all have impacts on the water chemistry which are magnified when you put large quantities of corals in a small volume of water. Kelkwasser will raise the pH, calcium reactors will lower the pH, and two-part will slowly raise salinity. Adding a sump will come close to doubling the water volume and basically cut any of these effects in half. However, if you use Kelkwasser or a calcium reactor, you should still keep a close eye on the pH. In fact, a pH monitor or aquarium controller is pretty much required, and you should watch the salinity if you're using two-part. You will have to select one of these options. None of them are wrong and they all have advantages. And a prop tank has some unique requirements that doesn't exist in a standard tank. For instance, this is supposed to be a profitable endeavor or at least low cost and Kelkwasser in your auto top off is likely to be the cheapest long term solution. And other than adding carbonate, calcium and elevating pH, there's very little effect in overall water chemistry. However, we're going to select two part in this case and the primary reason is we find it the easiest to adjust. With a frag tank, you're constantly adding and removing corals in different stages of growth and the rate of calcium and carbonate being consumed will correlate to this. More or less, after I sell half my corals, I'm going to need to reduce the amount of calcium and alkalinity added by around half as well. While this can be done with Kelkwasser or a calcium reactor as well, this means changing the amount of calc dissolved or dose to the tank, which can be a pain in the butt to nail down when you're constantly selling or adding corals. Constantly tuning a reactor to adjust for volume of corals and growth isn't realistic for most people unless you're very experienced with the process and have a natural instinct for how to adjust the bubble rate and flow rate to get the addition you're looking for. With two-part, all I have to do is change the digital timer on my doser or use a controller to cut the dose in half or add 10 to 20 percent a month for growth. However, because two-part is salt-based, it will have a slow elevating effect on salinity, so adjusting for this and keeping up on water changes is important. I'm going to use a controller. On an SPS tank, I want to keep a closer eye on the pH, and by the time I've purchased a pH controller, timers, power bars, and a wave maker, it just makes sense to get a controller and have the added features they bring at little to no additional cost. The internal temperature controller is probably the biggest benefit since heaters fail constantly. This is supposed to be a multi-year profitable endeavor, and heater failure just isn't an option. For a heater, we selected the low profile option from Cobalt Aquatics again. For lighting, we're going with the ATI T5 fixture. Again, I want to go with something easy to use, fits the shape of the tank, and uses technology that's been proven very effective in large scale propagation systems. And ATI is pretty much the go-to brand when it comes to T5 technology. This time we selected the CJ Voyager pumps for flow. The nice thing about the 2, 3, and 4 is they use an impeller design rather than a prop, which can start in either direction. Most AC prop based pumps have to start in a single direction so they all have some type of mechanism to prevent the prop from starting backwards. On a wave maker this mechanism wears out. If a pump turns on and off every 5 minutes it might not sound like much but that's 12 times an hour, 288 times a day and over 100,000 times a year. It's pretty easy for that mechanism to fail when it experiences that much use. This impeller design Cicce uses can spin either way and will stand up to on-off style wave makers substantially better. If you're not using your own controller, they have a standalone wave maker called the Wave Surfer. Like the one from Hydor, it has two outlets, but you can plug multiple pumps into a single outlet if you like. This one's rated for up to 100 watts per channel. For filtration, you can use basically any common method. Live rock in the sump is probably the most popular. Just to be different, we're going to use a ceramic biomedia for Marine Pure. I like this stuff because it adds an immense amount of surface area in a really small package and comes clean ready to use. Let's get to plumbing. Alright, so there's a hundred ways to plumb this thing, but we're going to use the kit that we've assembled here on the website. And the first step is to go ahead and drill the holes in the bottom for our overflow. You'll notice that this tank has two little divots here made for centering your holes and installing bulkheads. So just center right on top of one and start your hole. Next, we're going to want to get off as many of these burrs as possible so we can get a nice clean seal with the bulkhead. You can really use pretty much any tool of your choice. Once you have the holes drilled, you just want to go ahead and disassemble your bulkhead. You can see we've already installed one of them. 
It has three parts, uh, the main head, the screw, and the gasket. The gasket is definitely going to go on the inside of the tank. Just put it in the hole and screw on the nut on the bottom to install. The next bit here is to cut a couple lengths from our one inch pipe for our emergency and standard overflow. The pipe for the emergency overflow should be about five and a quarter inches. So we'll go ahead and mark it there and cut it. The pipe for the second overflow will be a little bit shorter at about three and a half inches. This depends somewhat on how high you want the water level to be in the tank. So now that we have our pipe cut, we're gonna go ahead and glue some of the pieces together. The first step is to apply your primer. The primer will melt a small amount of the surface of the fitting in the pipe so that they adhere together better. And I like to apply the cement to both the fitting as well as the pipe. When you insert it, make sure you push it all the way in and give it a nice twist and then hold it all the way down to the bottom because uh, as it's cementing together, it's heating up and expanding slightly, which can push the pipe out a bit. So when you're all done gluing, it should look basically like this, with the emergency overflow being a bit taller than the standard overflow. I'm going to go ahead and screw in our strainer. I've already applied the plumber's tape to this fitting. Believe it or not, there's different qualities of plumber's tape out there. And you can tell pretty easily just by squeezing it. The harder it is, the denser the material is and thicker. So you don't have to do as many wraps and it will get into the crevices quite a bit better. This one's uh, actually half inch wide, so it's a lot easier to apply as well. Once the overflows are assembled, just screw them into the bulkheads. And this portion of it's done. Once you have this assembled, go ahead and check the height of both of your overflows. There could have been small variances in your cut or how deep you got the pipe into the fitting. This one's a little bit more forgiving with the strainer and your emergency overflow can be adjusted if need be by just cutting a little bit off the top. To assemble the bottom of the overflow, it's pretty simple. For the emergency, we're just gonna go ahead and glue a male pipe thread adapter on the bottom and screw it in. This is about 14 inches in length, but you can make it the height that you want it for your equipment. And on the main overflow, we're gonna make it about the same length, but we're going to put a ball valve in the center. By uh, putting this in the middle, we'll be able to tune the amount of water going down the main overflow so it creates a full siphon. So this is what it looks like installed underneath with our emergency overflow and our primary right here. Primary again has the gate valve to adjust the flow. Next step is to drill your hole for the bulkhead and return line. Resist the temptation to drill in the center because these two little divots will get in the way of making a proper seal. So just use them to make your hole again. Once the hole's drilled, go ahead and install your three quarter inch bulkhead. Again, we want the seal on the inside of the tank, the water side. Next, we're gonna build our return assembly. I cut my piece of pipe here to about five inches. It could vary a little bit based on your return pump and how you have your overflow tuned. Once you have it all glued together, go ahead and snap your lock line together and thread it into your return. Once you have it installed, this is pretty much what it'll look like and you can adjust your return height with the nozzle pretty easily. At this point we're basically done and all that's left is to screw our barbed insert fitting into the bulkhead on our return and then connect our pump with some tubing. It's always a good idea to use hose clamps when using barbed fittings on your plumbing. So that only took us about 30 minutes and was pretty easy. I do want to point out why we have two overflows here. The first one has a strainer on it which will keep livestock from going down the drain. However, that strainer could get clogged so we have the emergency overflow to take up the excess water if need be. So this is what it will look like once you have water in the tank. It won't be completely silent because of the fairly shallow tank that we're dealing with but you can adjust the flow rate of your pump and the flow rate going down the drain with a gate valve to get something pretty quiet. One of the things we did is use a Speedwave controllable DC pump for our return, which makes it a lot easier to adjust the flow rate. Lastly, there are a few common questions reefers have about systems like these. First one is, where's the skimmer? Whether or not you use a skimmer will be largely based on if and what you plan on feeding. If there's no fish food, a skimmer really isn't required unless you want to feed coral specific foods. And with some of the more expensive coral foods, you might not want a skimmer to remove them.
Everyone has a different take on this, and I suggest you take everything you hear, pass it through your own experience, and try different things to get the best results. Thing is, all foods are going to feed algae growth and add phosphate, which can slow calcification. Flip side of that is many people feel corals simply grow faster in tanks which have livestock and nutrients from feeding. My personal advice is to only add livestock that serves a purpose, like fish that eat algae or other pests. As to coral foods, if it isn't a coral where you can literally see them capture the prey, I prefer to use products based on amino acids or carbohydrates which have already been broken down rather than prey-based foods which corals have to capture and break down themselves. One of the more economical solutions is the Reef Energy Program by Red Sea. There are also options like Elos and Coral and Zucht. The KZ products are nice because there's an entire community at zeovit.com that has used their products effectively and can offer advice. KZ products are often just thought of as Zeovit, but that's really just a small part of what they offer. To make it a bit simpler, we separated the KZ products out on our site into Zeovit system, color enhancers and elements, coral nutrition, and problem solvers. For this purpose, most of you will be looking at the coral nutrition because we want them to grow faster in a propagation tank. If you're new to these products, the best advice I can give is try the Nano Power Package first. These are the products that most people start with, and at around $12 a bottle, this is probably the most affordable way to test the products and see if they provide value to you. If the extra growth is valuable enough to continue in your system, I would try some of the color enhancers next, since color quality directly enhances the value of corals you're trying to trade or sell. Another common question about this system in particular is in reference to the fact that it looks a lot like a hydroponics growing system. That's because it's exactly what it is. Our industry loans products from basically every water-related industry. There's also a good chance that you might be able to find a system like this somewhat cheaper if you're lucky enough to have a good hydroponic store near you. A good portion of the cost with this setup is in shipping large stuff like this across the nation. If you don't have a hydroponic store near you, we have them available on our site so everyone has easy access to something like this. Lastly, many people want to know if you could use a glass or acrylic tank as a sump instead of this container, and you absolutely could. However, this tank is designed for this purpose, which makes it the ideal height to hold a large volume of water and still provide easy access to get things in and out of the tank. So thanks for hanging out with us this week. Comment down below. And let me know if this propagation thing is something you're interested in. Would you recommend it to other reefers or any advice you have? I look forward to hearing your thoughts and interacting with you in the comments. If you're new here, we'd love to have you subscribe and hit that like button. I'll see you guys next week with another BRS TV video.